Dear friends in Christ Jesus, on 16th July every year, we are celebrating worldwide the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, a feast that is so dear to each one of us because of our special devotion to the Holy Scapular as a sign of our filial love for our Heavenly Mother on one hand and her maternal love and protection for us on the other. The feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel has its origin on Mount Carmel where some lay hermits grouped together near the fountain of Elijah in a ravine around two and a half kilometers or miles south of modern city of Haifa at the Wadi and Ashia in Israel. They built a small chapel there and dedicated it to Mother Mary and called themselves as the brothers of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, thereby taking her as the model of their contemplative lifestyle. Most of these hermits, who continued in the school of Prophet Elijah, knew too well their origins and the uniqueness of their traditions which descended from Prophet Elijah, a man who was filled with the zeal for Yahweh. These Carmelites hermits, who were mostly lay people, remained in their cells, or better I would say, in the natural caves that one finds in the, on the slopes of Mount Carmel, or around it, meditated day and night on the law of the Lord, and kept to vigil in contemplative prayer, unless occupied with other lawful duties. It is from these monks belonging to the Carmelite order, we have today one of the richest traditions of the Mother Church, the tradition of imparting the art of contemplative spirituality. In this discourse, I consider it as my deemed privilege to share with you the bounty of this richness under the title Carmelite Contemplative Spirituality as it is given to us by the Carmelite mystics. What is contemplative spirituality? The word spirituality simply means an approach one takes in life to go about dealing with life routine or in other words the orientation of one's lifestyle. Taking our cue from this simple meaning, we may define contemplative spirituality as a way of life where one makes contemplation or living in the intimacy of God as one's approach to life and one's lifestyle. Maybe by analyzing deeper into the meaning of contemplative prayer, we may get a better understanding about contemplative spirituality. The expression contemplative prayer means an intimate personal relationship with God in and through the person of Jesus with the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is a mode of falling in love with God and growing in that love till one reaches the total union with God. This total union with God also brings along with it the total perfection or transformation of the human person. St. Teresa of Avila defines contemplation as an intimate sharing between friends or living in total conformity with the will of God. Book of Life, chapter 8, number 5. It begins with what is popularly called the prayer of the heart, where one's entire being is raised to God in the intimacy of love. In other words, it is relationship with the divine where one's body, mind, emotions and the spirit are all unified at the core of one's entire being. 
In this prayer form, one raises one's entire person in a unique relationship of love, entrusting thereby oneself to him alone to be encaptured and transformed. The question that arises in our mind at this juncture is, is this contemplative spirituality as a way of life meant for me, a family person, a lay person who is so busy with so many things from morning till late night? My answer would be a very big positive yes. Contemplative spirituality is a habitual way of life that every baptized Christian can or should imbibe in one's quest for God experience. In other words, if we accept that to be a Christian means to be like another Christ in this world, it would be impossible for anyone to reach this goal unless and until we build that intimate relationship with Jesus in and through this contemplative union. Secondly, let me remind you, my viewers, what St. John Paul II wrote in his apostolic letter, Novo Millennio in Eunte, concerning the new revival that is taking place in the church of today, in the ambience of the quest for God experience and the need of imbibing a contemplative spirituality. He writes, The time has come to repropose wholeheartedly to everyone this high standard of ordinary Christian living. The whole of life of the Christian community and of Christian families must lead in this direction. It is also clear, however, that the paths to holiness are personal and calls for a genuine training in holiness. This training in holiness calls for a Christian life distinguished from all in the art of prayer. Continuing the discourse further, the Pope says, How can we forget here the teachings of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila? Number 31 and 32. There are two aspects of this quote that I want to emphasize here. The first one being that there is a personal path to holiness possible. And I would say it is growing stronger and stronger in our own times more than ever before. And the second aspect is that there is a genuine training that is required to glow in that holiness. In other words, Pope John Paul II speaks about a personal call to holiness to which we are called and secondly, we require a genuine training to grow in this holiness. This means contemplative spirituality is a sine qua non condition for our personal holiness. But the question again before us is, how shall we practically do it? Let us go into the treasure house of the Carmelite mystics, St. John of the Cross and St. Therese of Avila, so that we may learn from them this profound but simple way to our Christian holiness. Contemplative spirituality, just like any Christian spirituality, is strongly founded on four pillars of Christian lifestyle. They are the divine intimacy or deep friendship with God in and through contemplative prayer. Second, imitation of Christ or making the word of God and the life of Christ as one's own. Number three, the purification of the soul through a process of detachment and self-abnegation. And the fourth one is living a virtuous life in and through the participation in the sacramental life of the church. These four foundations 
should not be taken as a watertight compartment. Rather, the four aspects of the same journey towards one's perfection. Let us see how we can appropriate these four pillars of our own contemplative lifestyle. The first one, divine intimacy or a deep friendship with God in and through contemplative prayer. The first step into contemplative spirituality is the awareness that God loves us so much and therefore how much we have to respond to this divine love through our loving filial surrender. Revel Book of Revelations so beautifully puts it, Behold, I come and knock at the door of your heart. If you open the door, then I will come and dine with you and you with us. Revelations chapter 3 verse 20. Contemplative prayer is nothing but a capacity of the soul to keep itself open to God so that he may fill it with this unconditional love. That is the reason why we call contemplative prayer a loving attentiveness to God. Or as St. Therese of Avila would say, an intimate relationship with him who is my intimate friend or the beloved of my heart. It is in this divine intimacy the soul learns to live in conformity with the will of God. Although one may feel initial hardships because of the distractions and the privation of the senses, as days go by, this loving attentiveness becomes so intense that the soul is able to settle down in God and God alone and experience the intense divine love gushing forth from one's heart. The second one, imitation of Christ or making the word of God and the life of Christ as one's own. In fact, the goal of our spiritual journey is the personal transformation that is learning to be like Jesus our Lord and beloved. It is for this purpose God became human person so that he may teach you and me how to be truly human and truly divine. Imitation of Christ, therefore, is a sine qua non condition for spiritual growth. St. John of the Cross stresses the need of the imitation of Christ for every beginner in spiritual life when he says, first, have a habitual desire to imitate Christ in all your deeds by bringing your life in conformity with his. You must then study his life in order to imitate him and behave in all events as he would. Ascent of Mount Carmel, Book 1, Chapter 13, Number 3. In order to imitate Christ, one's beloved and teacher, one should make the word of God as the textbook of one's life and learn to live it in all its fullness. Number three, purification of the soul through a process of detachment and self-abnegation. It is a great realization, my dear friends, in one's life that one neither can grow in the likeness of Christ nor grow in spiritual life because of one's inordinate appetites of the soul. And one's need to begin the journey of purification of the soul. The purification of the soul begins by the purification of the each of the our senses. That is the purification of the external senses, the purification of the internal senses, and the spiritual senses of memory, intellect, and will. It is a process of bringing back all our senses from their inordinate appetites back to the ordinate appetites as God wants them to be. I want to remind you that this is not an easy task, but the most painful and time-consuming. And that is maybe one of the reasons why St. John of the Cross calls it the active night of the soul. The first step 
in the direction of the purification of the soul is through the cultivation of the virtue of detachment or death to self. In order to be the friend of the beloved, the lover requires to give up all clinging, all worldly pleasures, including all anxieties of life, and cling on to the beloved alone. The Song of Songs summarizes the need of detachment in one's life because the beloved wants her to come out of her comfort zones and seeks the beloved alone on the mountains and in the valleys. Song of Songs, chapter 5, numbers or verses 2 to 8. Remember, it was the command to detachment that was given to Abraham. Leave your country, your kindred, and your father's house, and go where I will send you. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It was the same command given to Moses at the burning bush. Remove the sandals of your feet, for today onwards, I am your security. Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. It was the command given also to the prophets. Mother Mary, apostles, and it is a biblical imperative to everyone who wants to follow Jesus. There is another type of detachment one has to go through if one has to prepare one's heart completely to God. St. John of the Cross is of the opinion that there is only one block to spiritual growth, which he calls ego, or what we call the false self. Ego, or the false self, and the true self, which is created in the image and likeness of God, can never go together. Hence, it is imperative that one sheds all the shackles of ego in order to allow God to take possession of one's heart. What is important to know is that ego manifests itself in seven varied forms, which we call the seven capital sins. They are pride, lust, anger, jealousy, greed, gluttony, and sloth. At this stage, therefore, one takes up to detach oneself even from this bondage of the false self, so that one is cleansed of all things that does not belong to God. However, one has to remember that this entire spiritual journey that we are talking about is not a journey in loneliness that you undertake all alone. No, rather it is a journey of accompanied friendship, accompanied by none other than our God himself. Therefore, for a beginner, although it seems so hard to leave one's customary ways and follow the narrow path, the initial zeal to love God coupled by the tremendous love which God awakens within one's heart, helps the person to move forward with enthusiasm and love. When you are a generous to God, He blesses you by filling your heart with this love and consolation. God also fills one's mind with the capacity to attentiveness and God's beauty, truth and goodness. St. John of the Cross says, just as a loving mother who warms her child with the heat of her bosom, nurses it with good milk and tender food and caresses it with her arms, so does our God nurture us in the initial stages. Dark Knight, Book 1, Chapter 1, Number 2. And the third one, living a virtuous Sorry, a fourth one, living a virtuous life in and through the participation in the sacramental life of the church. As the purification of the soul takes place, especially through the detachment of all inordinate appetites and the false self, the person begins to transform himself or herself in virtues or the very gift of divine nature. The two great virtues of Jesus our Lord, that is the virtue of humility and unconditional love of neighbor, slowly but steadily begins to grow. 
In fact, one has to remember that our growth in spiritual life is tested by the intensity of our virtuous life. In this entire contemplative journey, Mother Mary is the model and exemplar for excellence for us. That is one of the reasons why the first Carmelite monks made her their model by building a chapel on Mount Carmel and dedicating to her and calling themselves as brothers of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. There are, my dear friends, two reasons why we call Mary as our model of contemplation. Like Jesus, Mary was the one who surrendered her will to the will of God. And like Jesus, Mary was the one who dedicated herself to the mission of the kingdom. No wonder, therefore, Mary not only became the mother of Jesus, but also the perfect disciple of Jesus. It is for this reason why Jesus entrusts his disciples in the hands of Mary by saying, Behold your mother, so that we may learn from her how to be her real sons and daughters. Just as Mary treasured the word of God, first in her heart and then in her womb, so to every contemplative treasures the word incarnate in his or in her heart first and then in one's life as a witness. This filial devotion to Mary is manifested in Carmelite tradition in and through the devotion of the Holy Scapular. When we wear the scapular, we outwardly manifest what we inwardly profess. That is, Mother of Carmel, you are our mother and protectress. Help us to transform our life in the likeness of Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, as we celebrate this feast, my prayerful wishes of the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel to all my viewers, may Mother Mary of Mount Carmel help us all to grow in contemplative spirituality and accompany each one of us in our journey to the summit of Mount Carmel. Amen.